Hello, hello, everyone. Welcome back to Luncheon with the Experts at Carcinoid Cancer Foundation program brought to you by Tercera Therapeutics. My name is Rain Bennett. I am your host, and I'm a filmmaker that's been working with CCF for almost 10 years, folks, almost 10 years to create video content that helps uh, spread education and awareness about this disease. And then we do that sometimes in, a, in produced videos. This past year, we did one that was very treatment centric. And the year before that, we did one that was very patient centric, kind of stories of hopes or stories of how people have navigated this disease. And then lately, over the past year or so, we've been doing Lunch with the Experts and other live video series, which seem to have a really great impact. And, and it's been very fulfilling for me to be a part of this community. So if you are a regular, you know the deal. Let us know where you are uh, signing on from in the world. And if you're new, welcome to the show. Tell us where you are and say hello to everybody else. We love to see how far these programs reach. Before we go any further, I want to say... Thanks to our sponsor, Tercera Therapeutics. Without them, Lunch with the Experts would not be possible. And we always like to say a quick disclaimer from them before we fully get started with the show. And that is the opinions expressed by the guest presenters, as well as the question, questions asked by the audience at home, have not been created or suggested by the sponsors of, of the Lunch with the Experts program. CCF doesn't endorse or promote any of the views, opinions, or information presented and audience members should not rely solely on the opinions or information expressed by the guest presenter and should seek guidance and direction from their own medical advisors regarding any choices they make about their health or treatments. So that last line is really the takeaway. We're going to give you some guidance. We're hopefully going to answer some questions and give you some help along your journey, but by no means do we know your specific case. So take this information that we give you, bring it back to your home team who does know your case and make a plan together. So today I'm very excited to talk to my friend, Dr. Emily Bergsland. Dr. Bergsland, how are you? I'm fine. Thank you. Welcome to the show. We've been looking forward to having you on the show. I know you, you know you and I have worked together on other video series, but this is uh, the first time we've we've had you on luncheon with the experts, and, and we're really excited about it. Can you tell those um, who may not be familiar with you, if they're not, um, what exactly you do in this in the net space in the community? What is the role that you seek to fulfill? Got it. Thanks. Well, first of all, I want to thank Rain and Grace and CCF for inviting me today. This is really a, an honor to be here. So thank oh, you. Thanks. Um, I am a GI medical oncologist and I am based at the University of California, San Francisco. And I have um, really spent years uh, in the GI oncology field, but for the last 20 years or so, it's been largely focused on neuroendocrine tumors. So in my practice, I see patients with neuroendocrine tumors um, almost of all different sites and uh, ranging from very low-grade tumors to high-grade neuroendocrine carcinomas. And my research is focused um, largely on clinical trials in patients with advanced neuroendocrine neoplasms, uh, but we have other areas of research in our group, including looking at patient outcomes and biomarkers and uh, uh, other types of uh, collaborations like that. So that pretty much sums it up. I've been involved um, nationally on uh, various guidelines committees and with different organizations like the North American Neuroendocrine Tumor Society and um, really have um, been so grateful to see so many people um, interested in the field over the yeah. years. I mean, there's a pretty large community now of, of researchers and healthcare providers now not just in the United States, but also abroad. And I think we're seeing more um, collaboration and uh, progress in the field as a result of it. Awesome. Now, uh, do, you, do you work with uh, lung nets as well? I do see patients with lung nets, usually um, if they're advanced. Okay. Uh, for early, early stage tumors um, in our group are typically treated by the disease group for that, wherever it started. Yep. Um, but advanced stage tumors will often see no matter where they um, have arisen. Got it. Got it. Thanks. Okay, folks, I see we have a lot of people already joining us, which is exciting because we're just getting started. We people all over the States and even Ursula from from Jeffrey's Bay, South Africa. Love to see that, especially uh, joining us live. Um, so most of you all know the flow of the program. Go ahead and send in your questions. We're going to do our best to get to all of them, but inevitably we don't because there are so many, which is a good problem. Uh, and hopefully we can keep bringing this show to you. But if, if you have follow-up questions, if we don't get to your um, 
question, don't get you the answer that you're looking for. Just know that you can follow up with CCF either here on the Facebook page, you can send them a private message, or you can reach out to them on their website, carcinoid.org. And they I promise you they will do everything in their power to get you the direction or the specialist you need to talk to or the answer to your question. Um, two things I want to ask you to do at home. You all have been doing such a good job and you help me uh, do my job better. One is if you know someone that would benefit from this program, because the real value, there's a lot of information that we're going to cover, but the real value is this interactive, this virtually interactive session that you have with our expert with Dr. Bergslin today. So if you know someone that would benefit from this, a patient, a caregiver, anyone that might have a question, go ahead and tag them in the comments, share this video to their page, get them here so they can hopefully get that question across. If they don't make it, or if you want to revisit this video, it will live uh, on the Facebook page. It'll be evergreen. It'll be here under the videos tab. You can always access it. And starting Monday, we'll republish it to YouTube for those that don't have Facebook. And the second ask that I have of you, and you all have been doing a great job of this as well, is if you see a question in the sidebar that you also have, or you're also interested in the answer uh, for you can like it or love it. There's a bunch of different reactions Facebook gives you the option to, but either way, it shows me there's a demand and it kind of upvotes that question and it makes makes me realize, okay, we definitely want to get that one across. So that's just an easy and effective way for me to know uh, if a lot of people have that same question. Finally, before we get started, have you downloaded CCF's free net cancer health storylines app? This app makes it very, very easy to record your symptoms, medications, nutritional concerns, moods, and, and everything else. So check that out. If you haven't, we will put a link in the comment box. Okay, let's get the let's get the show started. Start sending in your questions. Uh, Dr. Bergslin, um, how long would you say now you've been working with neuroendocrine tumors? Uh, I would say my practice has been focused on it for about 20 years. 20 years. Uh, yeah. And, and in that space of time, you know, I talk with a lot of doctors, a lot of experts, and it seems to have been, especially in the last 10 years, like a lot of progress made, a lot of uh, things that have emerged that to, to help, you know, treat this disease better, diagnose this disease better. Um, what are some of the things that have allowed you or helped you do your job better that have happened in that, in the span of that 20 years, like significant leaps forward, if, if there are any? Well, I mean, for sure, just progress in terms of available therapies. I mean, that that's definite. I mean, when I started out, there were just very few treatment options for patients. We use liver directed therapy. Uh, we had one somatostatin analog, a triotide, and right. streptozosin was approved for pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. And of course, over the last 10 years, we've seen the approval of a lot of other uh, treatments, which has been really, really helpful. And I think there's still, you know, much room for improvement, but it's uh, certainly some real advances. The other things I think that have been really helpful for me personally is seeing a lot of patients. And I would say that that I can't stress enough uh, for me was really focusing in on the disease and seeing a lot of people because then over time, you really get a sense of the spectrum of the disease. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that has been uh, really helpful. And um, I'm still learning, honestly, at, at this point in my career, I'm still seeing things I haven't seen before right. and, and learning about about um, different uh, variants and, and uh, changes uh, that the disease can, can demonstrate over time, particularly in, in some of these um, situations where we're seeing uh, something called grade progression or grade, grade migration, where the tumor can change a little bit over time in some cases. Yeah. Um, and that links to the other advance, I think, which is the pathology. I think we're getting better at describing these tumors under the microscope mm. and sort of characterizing them and understanding that they're not all one, just one type of tumor, totally. but in fact, there might be differences by organ site or even within the organs, there's a range and a real spectrum of the disease that we're getting better at characterizing, although it's not, it's not perfect. And then linked to that, I guess I would say is imaging. There have been advances in imaging and I think certainly DOTA scans um, have been a real advance over our traditional somatostatin scintigraphy or octria scans. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of progress, but still a lot of room for improvement. And this concept of, did you call it uh, grade progression? Is that right? Yeah. There were two names, right? 
Yeah, or, or grade migration. Migration, People, yeah, that one yeah. Paints, yeah. paints a good picture as well. This yeah. is a question that's come up a lot uh, in the past few weeks or uh, on the show, so I'd be interested to see if anyone has that question, but I'm glad that you brought that up because I know that there's some curiosity and some questions about that. And I think your point about the experience is so is so uh, spot on because because of how unique this disease is and there is no one path that it's going to take, the, you know, makes sense. The more often you see it, the more often you see ways that it you know turns it could have taken and it gives you a better you know better chance uh to to approach it if you've seen something like that before and like you said you're still learning learning new things about it every day so to that point if someone was seeing uh you know seeing a doctor who hadn't had a lot of experience with it is it safe to say like a piece of advice would be to find someone uh that is if they're not a specialist, they've, they've seen this frequently or how important is that to, to find someone who does have, maybe it's not 20 years, but it has seen, you know, seen this disease many times before. I, I mean, I, I look at it from the vantage point of somebody who's a specialist in this. And I, I think yeah. it's helpful to see a specialist, but the one thing that I, I, I really do feel strongly about is that it's important to have both because mm. a lot of the care for this disease can be delivered close to home. And so a, a lot of what we do is work with patients, local oncologists. And I think it works really well because in many cases, this is, is, this is a disease that, that patients live with for many years. And so quality of life is important and convenience is important. And um, you know, being able to get care close to home, I think is often really valued by patients. And so it, it, it tends to work quite well, actually, yeah. when people have a local team and then periodically see somebody who, who has a lot of experience with the disease and help can guide some of the bigger treatment decisions. Yeah, I like that a lot. That makes a lot of sense with the with the specialist kind of informing and using their experience to inform, inform the process and then the home team executing, basically, um, and providing the direct care. And I think that's a, that's a good point. Um, we've already got a lot of questions coming in, so I'm going to go ahead and start, start taking some of those. Um, the first one comes from Judy, which seems like a couple of people had this question. What's the, and this is a diet and nutrition question, which comes up a lot. And Judy says, what is the best diet for carcinoid cancer or uh, without, like if you don't have carcinoid syndrome, if you don't have those symptoms, is there, is, is there a specific diet that people should follow? Or are there certain nutritional concerns they should be considering? You know, I think that's a great question. And one that actually should be studied in this disease. It hasn't been well studied in this disease, but it's been studied in some other cancers. And I would just use the caveat that the best data we have are from diseases that are more common. So prostate, breast cancer, um, colon cancer, for example. Mm -hmm. And in a, in a population that's been had their initial tumor removed. And uh, those patients are recovered from surgery and are being followed long term. And in those populations, it seems that what is described as sort of a healthy diet or a non-Western diet is is associated with better outcomes. Mm -hmm. And so, and what we mean by that in when we talk about this in oncology, it's diets that are lower in fats, lower in red meats, uh, tend to be weighted more towards fish and uh, uh, white meats, uh, lots of fruits and vegetables. And that kind of diet is sort of just the general diet that we recommend for patients with cancer. But I admit that this is really pulling from data from other diseases mm -hmm. and um, data in patients with, uh, by and large, with resected disease. And that's often a different situation than our patients with neuroendocrine tumors. But I think it's a reasonable strategy just as a, a baseline approach. Mm -hmm. and. We often have patients meet with a nutritionist just to go over these basic principles um, and, and extend that to also include uh, exercise, which again, we don't have a lot of good data on neuroendocrine tumors, but pulling from some other tumors, we typically recommend 150 minutes of exercise a week, which is 30 minutes times five as kind of ballpark mm -hmm. um, and a healthy body weight. And again, that's all extrapolating from other cancer types, but I think there's a lot of room for studying this and that better understanding it in neuroendocrine tumors specifically. Absolutely. Thanks, Judy, for your question. And just to let you know, uh, you know, I said at the top of the program that I've been working with CCF for a long time to help uh, create video content for all sorts of um, aspects of this disease. And we've addressed nutrition before, even on the show, we've had a few um, 
nutritionists and registered uh, uh, dietitians. So definitely refer back to the videos tab or you can go to YouTube on the Carson Cancer Foundation's YouTube channel. And there's a, there's a, I mean, there's a lot of videos to, to sort through, but we definitely have some on nutrition. This is also a good opportunity for people in the community and in the comment section to, to share any, any thoughts that you may have. That's one of my favorite things about the show and the overall community is just, you know, we'll give you information and advice from experts, but also collectively sharing stories and sharing experiences uh, helps people out a lot as well. So folks, welcome to Lunch with the Experts. If you joined us late, we're here with Dr. Emily Bergslin. Uh, I forgot to mention this at the beginning, but pardon the, uh, the lights and things behind me. I was recording for an online course this week. Um, so hopefully that's not too distracting. These aren't like alien aliens standing up behind me. Uh, but we've got great numbers. Love to see it. We're going to keep pushing forward. Next question from Karen, who this question comes up uh, frequently as well. And in, in, in these days, what is your opinion on the COVID-19 vaccine for us, for patients? How have your patients reacted to any of the shots? Well, thanks, Karen, for that question. I, I think, um, you know, this is a hot topic right now, for sure. And um, we actually, you um, put together a uh, panel on this and discussed it a few months ago now in January. And okay. really, you know, there's not a lot of data for neuroendocrine tumors specifically, but for cancer patients, there is there is guidance out there. And the recommendation is that patients do receive the, the COVID-19 vaccination. And that's what we recommend for our patients. There are really very few absolute contraindications to this vac these vaccines. It's really just if you've had a specific allergic reaction to this type of vaccine before, which is, which is quite rare. Mm -hmm. um, and um, also the guidance is really not so much to um, worry about the timing of it. You know, if you're on a somatostatin analog, for example, it's felt that it's fine to get the vaccination while you're on the somatostatin analog. If you're a patient who's just about to start chemotherapy or just about to have surgery, it would be ideal to have the vaccination, at least one of them done before you're starting your therapy. And we also recommend, um, and the reason for that, by the way, is that um, some treatments like chemotherapy, which can be immunosuppressive, could reduce the um, response to the vaccination. And so if it's possible to get the vaccine done before the chemotherapy, that's ideal. But if you're already on chemotherapy, it's just recommended that you get it um, while you're on chemotherapy. And then in terms of procedures like surgery or embolization, um, part of the reason for doing it beforehand, if possible, or, or after, is just that you um, can understand the difference between the side effects or the you know, complications of surgery. For example, a fever after surgery could be confusing if you get the vaccination. We may not know if it's from the vaccination or if it's from an infection, for example, after surgery. So we try to separate the vaccination from big procedures like surgery by a week or more. Um, but vaccination um, side effects, I'm not aware of any increased side effects in patients in neuroendocrine tumors. And as you probably all know by now, uh, the Moderna and Pfizer vaccinations require two injections, uh, whereas the J&J uh, &J vaccination is one. And I think we're just starting to get experience with the J&J &J vaccination because that one's new. Absolutely. Thanks, Karen. Ho hopefully that helps. Next question from Clinton. This one comes up frequently as well. Have you personally or Nanats officially uh, taken a position on the net test? It's all, uh, it seems that it's only a matter of time before it displaces chromogran and A as a net marker. Thoughts? Yeah, I wouldn't say the organization has uh, taken a position and, and my own position is I think it's a very interesting test and I'm, I'm really looking forward to see additional studies in the area to see where it fits in in terms of our um, other, other available biomarkers that we have. Got it. Thanks, Clinton. Um, and just a reminder, and I've said this, you know, every time that someone asks about the net test, which is highly discussed and debated these days, and there's a lot of interest behind it. And I think the only... I think people are just wanting more information basically to, to really take their stance on it. But we did have uh, Dr. Maudlin on the show, actually the first episode of Lunch and the Experts back in July. Um, 
obviously he, he has his thoughts on the net test. He created it, but there's a lot of information in that show. It's a whole, a whole hour of talking specifically about this. So I would recommend watching that. Uh, but I do know that there's a lot of people, a lot of people interested in this and, and many people that don't quite have enough information to, to take a full stance on it. But thanks for your question from Jane or Jamie. Uh, would you discuss what a DAX DAXX mute? What is a DAX mutations in a PNET with extensive liver involvement? And then does grade make a difference? Yeah, interesting question. So DAX is a mutation that's typically seen in pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. Mm -hmm. um, it's often uh, the other one that sort of goes along with DAX is ATRX. Um, and those genes are involved in... Um, uh, some of the cellular processes that affect our, our DNA or chromatin, and they can be, these genes can be mutated. And like I said, when they're mutated, it's often in pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. And I bring this up just because mutation profiling isn't routine in neuroendocrine tumors, but if somebody has mutation profiling and I, I see a DAX mutation, I would definitely think about them having a pancreatic primary tumor site if that wasn't already known, that would certainly point the arrow towards that. Um, right now, DAX mutation doesn't have any specific, um, what we would call actionability, which means we, we don't know what to do with the DAX mutation other than it's there. And it's likely, like, as I said, it's common in a pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor. And so we don't alter our therapies right now uh, if there's a DAX alteration. So I would say, um, it's there's there's interest in developing therapies and potentially clinical trials that might bin patients or categorize them based on whether or not they have a DAX or ATRX mutation, but we're not there yet. It's it's really still early days in terms of the uh, molecular profiling of these tumors. Got it. Thank you. Next question from Tracy. Tracy says, I've noticed that a lot of people seem to also have autoimmune diseases that, that people that have this cancer. Uh, also seem to have autoimmune diseases. Can they be, you know, can they be related in some way? Is this something you've seen before? You know, this is a really great question and I don't know if anyone has studied this. Mm. Um, what I can say is autoimmune diseases, diseases are pretty common. And True. especially um, when patients are being followed for a long time in a medical practice with a disease, let's say a neuroendocrine tumor, what I don't know is if you're more likely to be diagnosed with things like an autoimmune disease because you're under care for a longer period of time and you're regularly seeing providers, or if there's actually an association with autoimmune diseases and neuroendocrine tumors. I, I, I'm not aware of one, um, but I, I will say just anecdotally, um, I would agree they're common. We see a lot of patients with you know thyroid disease and other, other autoimmune diseases, but I don't know of any link to neuroendocrine tumors. Got it. Well, thank you for your question. Uh, Dr. Bergson, let's talk a little bit about your research. Um, are there any trials coming up or studies that have come out recently that that you're excited about? Anything that um, that you think would be helpful for people coming up? Well, I would say in terms of um, my own research, some of the things that we're looking at or trying to look at um, differences um, different ways to utilize imaging that's done. So it turns out, you know, patients are well aware of the fact that they have CT scans and MRIs to assess their tumors over time, but we have projects looking at, are there features with embedded within that information that's already right in front of us mm -hmm. that actually may be helpful to characterize the tumors and understand uh, response to therapy. Uh, so one, one type of research is called radiomics, where you're basically looking at data that's already in the CT scan and the MRI, but you're looking at it at a, a different level than you normally look at just with the naked eye. Um, so that's an interesting area because there's a real need to try to better understand who's likely to have a benefit from a given therapy upfront or potentially identify early on if the therapy's not likely to work. You know, could we ever get to a point where we could maybe change therapy sooner if it wasn't likely to work. Um, I think the other areas that are, are interesting to keep an eye on right now, certainly you know, we're hoping to better refine PRT and select patients for PRT. There's a lot of concepts out there and ideas for how we might um, improve PRT upfront in the, P in the patients who might not benefit from PRT, but also what do you do about patients 
after PRT doesn't work? And, you know, what's the role of uh, retreatment of PRT, for example? And I would say that's, again, just um, unknown right now. PRT was just approved in the United States in 2018. So there's a lot of um, work in that area. Uh, I think we'll see future trials coming down the pipeline to try to understand retreatment and also use of other types of PRT uh, radio uh, peptides. You know, there might be other types of uh, agents that can be used in addition to Lupetian 177 dotatate. Um, I would say another area that is really more an unmet need, but uh, a lot of interest, which is great, and work is in the poorly differentiated neuroendocrine carcinomas. And I think we really have struggled in that disease to make headway. There have been studies with immunotherapy and uh, there's ongoing studies with various chemotherapeutic agents. Um, but I would say on the bright side, there's a lot of interest in this area. And I think there are a lot of researchers that are studying it. And so um, I think it's always good if you have that disease to keep an eye out for clinical trials because it's we really need additional therapies in the poorly differentiated tumors. Um, so that's sort of the, the clinical side of things. Um, the uh, other area that I think is um, expanding is this idea of engaging patients in the process and understanding how patients are experiencing the side effects of treatments, the disease, et cetera. And I think, um, you know, we and others are, are really interested in trying to to integrate this into the the, uh, the workflow and the research in this area. And we're gonna be launching a project very soon called the ENET study, E-NET. Um, and that study is actually a, a study looking at patient reported outcomes that are around lifestyle and well-being, quality of life, symptoms, and history to try to understand uh, why these uh, why the tumors develop and also how, how they affect patients while they're living with the disease. And it uses a web-based platform that's been used successfully by um, the cardiology group at our institution. And it enrolls patients basically uh, nationwide. It'll be open to anybody who wants to participate using this web-based platform. And I know that um, uh, Grace will have information about that for people who are interested in participating. It should launch we think within the next couple of weeks. Oh, awesome. So, I mean, it, it, the web-based platform, is, is it kind of like a survey? Like people can just log on? Yeah, and it's a survey. The yeah, there's a deck of initial survey questions and then patients will be queried every six months um, for a few years uh, to follow them to sort of, um, again, see for changes over time. It's also questions about COVID and the impact yeah. of COVID on our patients. And I would say the one, a pretty unique feature about that survey is it uses uh, survey tools that are validated. So uh, for this study, we really, while it's tempting to develop a survey just, you know, of, of our own, because we know we think uh, there are certain symptoms that may be uh, uh, common in our patients, we really wanted to make sure we use survey tools that have already been studied and validated by other yeah. investigators. And so that's um, one of the unique features about this um, project. But the idea, if it works, is to try to um, study this from a big data perspective. So I think, you know, it's, it's not hard to do a, a study of, of 10 patients or 30 patients or maybe even 100. Right. But the question is, is there a way that we can leverage uh, people's comfort and ability to access uh, surveys by the web? to study this disease in a, in a on a larger scale. And so that that's the hope. There'll also be questions, for example, on diet and exercise, which gets to one of the, the previous questions we talked about. Awesome. I love that. Well, folks, you heard it here. Stay tuned for that study, ENETS, and it should be out in a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. That's our hope. Yeah. Amazing. Amazing. Uh, if you joined us late, folks, this is Luncheon with the Experts. We are here with Dr. Emily Bergslin. We're getting a lot of great questions and we're going to keep pushing forward. We've got about 30 minutes left. Um, okay. So Jennifer says, hello from Texas. I have PRT starting in January, 2018 when it became available here, um, which seemed, which resulted in seemingly permanent low white cell counts. I am considering a second series. What are your thoughts on potential issues with blood counts? Is that something you've heard of before? Yeah. So I think, um, in terms of the white count, it would depend on the, what the white count was, which component of the white cells. So, okay. 
Um, you know, white cells include neutrophils, which are the ones that really protect us from uh, most of the common bacterial infections. Uh, lymphocyte counts are perhaps um, a little less important. And so I'm not sure which count is low. Um, and so I would really defer to local providers about that in terms of deciding what's the uh, appropriate uh, count that's necessary for PRT. There are some patients who do have low counts that persist after PRT, although it's, it's pretty uncommon um, to have it be um, you know, profoundly low. So I don't know. I'd have to know more details about sure, this case. Sure. Now. This is gotcha. Thank, uh, thanks, Jennifer. Hope that helps a little bit. I meant to ask you this, Dr. Bergson, um, a little earlier. We got a question from a friend of the foundation, Pat Murphy. Uh, since we talked about some trials, she was asking, are you involved with any of the immunotherapy trials? Yeah, so uh, we have done immunotherapy trials, a couple of them actually along the way, um, and uh, in both low grade and high grade. And I would say that um, the challenge with the immunotherapy in this disease is that it doesn't work very well for the, for the group as a whole. Um, there are selected patients that seem to benefit from immunotherapy. And I give the best example would be there are very occasional patients, especially with the higher grade tumors that have um, something called a high tumor mutation burden or microsatellite instability, which is something you can tell um, sometimes by um, the pathologist can tell you that, or certainly with molecular profiling. And those patients do seem to have a much higher um, chance of benefit from immunotherapy. But as a group, as a whole, we have really uh, not found a combination or, or a single agent that seems to be um, reliably effective in the population. So the strategies moving forward really are focused around trying to understand if there might be new, new strategies for, um, in terms of immunotherapy agents, there are lots of other, you know, the, the initial agents, the, the, the PDL one targeting agents, uh, that was sort of the initial group, but there's actually other types of immunotherapy drugs that are in development that target other components of the pathway. And so there's interest in sort of exploring those or combinations. Um, there might be ways that you can actually um, combine immunotherapy with other treatments like PRT. We have a study open at UCSF, in fact, that looks at liver-directed therapy, so embolization, for example, plus immunotherapy. And also there's a, there's a cohort of patients getting PRT plus immunotherapy. So those sorts of combination strategies are under, um, under exploration as well. But it's frustrating because immunotherapy's, you know, been a big advance for so many other tumor types. I think we were all really hoping it would be really helpful in neuroendocrine tumors. And so far it hasn't been, hasn't panned out as, as well as we had hoped. Gotcha. Thanks, Pat. Appreciate your question. Next question from Tara. Um, do you have any current patients that are taking both uh, tamoxifen, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, because they have breast cancer, as well as somatostatin analog shots for metastatic nets in the liver? question is, can you take both of these treatments at the same time? Uh, thanks, Tara, for that question. Yeah, I, I can tell you I've had a few patients over the years that have had, had breast cancer and have been on tamoxifen or other uh, uh, hormones, and we've not noticed any problem with the combination. Um, and I would just say that that reminds me to say that we always keep our eyes open in, in following patients over time because it's actually not that rare to have two cancers. So um, unfortunately, we do see patients who either have already had a history of breast cancer or other cancers at the time they're diagnosed with the net or the other way around where they're being followed for a neuroendocrine tumor over a number of years and develop a second cancer. So it's just an argument to make sure you do continue to follow up with your general healthcare maintenance and you're having your uh, various, you know, annual exams because you have to keep your your um, eyes open for other medical problems that can emerge. Absolutely, thanks, Tara. Um, next question from Linda. Linda says, "Do you have the new Copper sixty four PET scan yet? And what are your feelings on it? And when do you think it will be widely available?" We do have the Copper sixty four scan. Uh, that's what we do at our center. So, for people who aren't familiar with this, this is another form of um, somatostatin receptor PET imaging, um, like the gallium-68 dotatate PET. 
Um, and Copper 64, it's uh, what we're doing at our institution. So I'm developing a comfort level with it. Um, it looks essentially about the same as a gallium 68 donotate pet. And I think ultimately they're going to be pretty interchangeable. I mean, I view them as interchangeable. And some of our patients, frankly, you know, will have a gallium 68 one time and another time the copper 64. And, you know, I think we can work with either one of them. They are, they're both considered uh, good tests. And in terms of availability, I, I don't know exactly um, what the uptake will be in the availability of copper 64 versus gallium 68 over time. Got it. Thank you. All right, moving right along. Still got some good time. Margaret's, Margaret and several other people, it looks like. Uh, are interested to know if you would please explain the way the octreotide affects the energy level and does it also impact the absorption of nut nutrients from food, specifically protein? Gosh, I wish I knew the answer to this. Okay. I, I don't, you know, I've had many patients say they have fatigue on somatostatin analogs. And I would say it's not limited to octreotide, but you know, on somatostatin analogs in general, and I just don't know, uh, I think it's hard to know how much of that is uh, from the tumor itself uh, versus having, versus the somatostatin, versus the somatostatin analog. So, and I don't, I don't know on a cellular level how it actually causes fatigue, but certainly we do see that on, an, on a regular basis, the patients report fatigue. And then the second question was- It was, does it, does it also impact the absorption of nutrients from food, specifically uh, protein? Yeah, I am not, I've not heard or seen data uh, about, heard about or seen data about absorption of protein. So what we do know is on somatostatin analogs over time, um, we need to monitor, we do monitor for thyroid function and uh, B12 levels over time. So, um, but I'm not aware of changes in protein. Got it. Got it. Uh, next question from Barbara. Barbara says, I have been NED, no evidence of disease since surgery in 2012. Uh, ileum, no lymph involve, involvement, small bowel resection. What, what are the chances of recurrence and will it appear someplace else? Now, I know that's a broad question and maybe not uh, easy to answer, but is recurrence something that typically happens? Does it happen somewhere else? What are your thoughts in general on this? Yeah, I would say um, the in general, when patients, the, the way we cure this disease is to resect it when it's early stage. So you can be cured if you have a localized tumor that's removed, but there is a risk of recurrence and the risk of recurrence um, depends on a number of factors. Um, in some cases, it's the size, the lymph node involvement, et cetera. But what we do know about this disease, which is a little different than other tumor types, is that the recurrences can happen um, over many years. So there are some cancers, for example, where we only do clinical follow-up for five years after resection. But what we know about neuroendocrine tumors is that we need to follow people longer. And so the current recommendations for follow-up after resection are to follow patients for 10 years. Mm -hmm. So really what's different about this compared to other tumor types is instead of a lot of frequent scans for five years, we do infrequent scans, but for a longer period of time. So current guidelines generally recommend about one scan a year, but for 10 years. And um, the recurrence is sometimes, um, you know, they can recur in a variety of different places, but I would say for the GI neuroendocrine tumors, a very common site of, of recurrence is the liver, uh, but there can be other locations of recurrence as well, um, including the lymph nodes, for example. But uh, I would say the liver, by and large, is a is a very common site for GI neuroendocrine tumors. Got it. Got it. Thank you, uh, Rebecca. Ask what are your thoughts? We're talking about um, managing symptoms here. What are, What are your thoughts on CBD versus prescribed medication? And we get we get questions about CBD semi frequently. Any thoughts? Any knowledge about uh, using that as a way to? Yeah, I don't have any specific recommendations for neuroendocrine tumors. I think it's right. a really interesting question. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, CBD products, um, I think there's growing, um, certainly growing acceptance and interest in them. I mean, they're widely available now, um, as opposed to THC, which has more psychotropic effects. And I think there's really more the pendulum is, is swung towards CBD. But I honestly can't say that I have any specific 
recommendations for neuroendocrine tumors. I think it's very um, individualized how people That's respond obvious. to these agents and, you know, whether they, they think they're valuable for things like um, sleep or um, uh, nausea or other symptoms. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I would suggest Rebecca, if I could, I mean, that's something that, you know, I know people have, uh, have used in the community. And so maybe, maybe reaching out to people here or in support groups, they may be able to share their experience with that. Um, Clint's Clint says, can you explain the relationship between, or the difference between carcinoid and neuroendocrine tumor? Okay. That is a really good question. Clint, I am probably guilty of using the word carcinoid myself. Um, it is it is an older term that technically we're not supposed to be, you know, we meaning right. like in the medical community, we're not supposed to be using anymore. So carcinoid, I like it though, because everyone understands <laughs> it, 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 it connotes something um, uh, special uh, to people like me, but pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors start in the pancreas. Um, carcinoid tumors I view as neuroendocrine tumors that start outside of the pancreas. So they can start in the, the lungs or the GI tract, like the, the stomach, the duodenum, the, um, the rest of the small bowel or the colon or the rectum. And bundled together, those neuroendocrine tumors um, are, when they're well differentiated, are called, um, they used to be called carcinoid tumors. So, like I said, the current terminology, if you get a pathology report now, it, you know, in mo modern day, it's not likely to say carcinoid tumor anymore. It's likely to say a well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumor arising in the stomach or arising in the rectum. Um, but uh, that's, they're, they're one and the same is the yeah. bottom line. It's, just a, it's just a different term, but, but I like it because it means it's a non-pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor. Absolutely. And Clint, uh, actually last week on the show, we had Dr. Mark Lewis from Intermountain uh, Healthcare in, in Utah, and he told uh, a great little story of how, of how that term came to be. Um, and, and the doctor that I guess coined it, and I know the foundation has, you know, this been around for over 50 years. And so Dr. Warner, that was what it was referred to back then, which is how CC, yeah. CCF got its name. Yeah. Uh, and I know it's something they've been, they've been thinking about, uh, as the thoughts on that name have, have changed over the years. Uh, yeah. thanks for, for your question, Clint. Hope you have a great day. Um, Heather says any upcome, any upcoming clinical trials or treatment for, for stomach nets? You know, I don't know of any specific um, trials for stomach nets. I think that um, it's important to understand for stomach neuroendocrine tumors, there's actually three types. Mm -hmm. And um, probably the most common one is type one. And type one happens when the stomach lining gets a little burned out, like from, uh, there's an autoimmune disease uh, called, um, at least to atrophic gastritis. And the stomach lining gets a little burned out and that leads the body to increase levels of gastrin and the gastrin then can cause little polyps to develop in the stomach that are little neuroendocrine tumors. And they're usually multiple and they're usually benign and they're usually removed by a GI doctor by scoping a person every year or two, they remove those. So that's type one and type two is also in the setting of high gastrin levels again, bathing the stomach lining. So you get multiple polyps that pop up, but that one's in the setting of a very special type of neuroendocrine tumor called a gastrinoma that's making gastrin. And um, so the stomach polyps there are really sort of almost a, just a side effect of the actual tumor, which is usually in or around the pancreas. And then the third type is type three, and that's called a sporadic neuroendocrine tumor, the gastrin levels are low in that situation. And um, that one tends to behave in a little more aggressive fashion, although it's quite rare. So um, the bottom line is it's, there isn't uh, just one type of stomach neuroendocrine tumor. And it's important to, to kind of work with your doctor to understand what type you might have, because the treatment approaches are actually a little bit different depending on the type that you have. Absolutely. Thanks. Thanks for that. Uh, Deborah, top fan of the foundation says after octreotide has been exhausted, what next? Do we know what disease? Not, um, not specifically. Um, yeah. So but... I, I, 
I would say it would vary on the disease. So, you know, it, it, it depends on a bunch of different things. So I'm going to assume here that this is a well-differentiated tumor. So a, a pretty slower, you know, a slower growing tumor that's well-differentiated. And um, in this case, um, it would depend on the extent of disease and the location of the disease and the rate of growth along with the primary site. Did it start in the pancreas or somewhere else? Uh, pancreatic tumors, we tend to use chemotherapy a little bit more. Uh, they, the, the shrinkage rate is a bit higher in pancreatic tumors. And also there's a drug called sunitinib that's approved in pancreas tumors, which isn't approved in the other ones. Um, the other factors that influence our treatment decisions are the patient's other medical problems, you know, liver function, kidney function, uh, other uh, medical issues that may be going on. Um, but it could range from a local therapy, like if it's limited disease in the liver, it could be a local therapy, even surgery or liver embolization to adding a medicine like um, Afinitor, also known as Everolimus to considering PRT as a possibility. Um, or as I said, if it was a pancreas tumor, sometimes chemotherapy, but there's actually, like I said, there's been some progress over the last 10, 15 years, and we have a number of treatment options. And that's why for, if you have five patients in a room, and I don't know how many are here on today's um, call, but you know, everyone's treatment path might be somewhat different from, mm -hmm. from the other. So it really depends on a variety of factors, what sequence uh, we choose for an individual case. Sure. Absolutely. Thanks, Deborah. Hopefully that helps. Cindy says, what treatments uh, are recommended for gastric nets in the stomach? So gastric nets, again, would be, um, if they're just localized in the stomach, then again, it would depend on those three types I was talking about. Type three, we actually often will do surgery. Whereas for type um, one, we're usually just removing it endoscopically. And type two, that's usually associated with the gastronoma. So there we're actually trying to find the gastronoma to treat. Um, if it's metastatic, so if it's spread somewhere, then we're treating it like we would a small bowel neuroendocrine tumor and all of the treatments that I just mentioned, PRT, Everolimus, liver-directed therapy, clinical trials, uh, those are all treatments that we would consider for those tumors. Got it. Clinton asks, how accurate are scans and scan readings in determining if nets are present? The data from the copper scan prescribing information seems to show about 10% misdiagnosis, missing nets that are there or finding nets that aren't there. Is, is this typical? Well, I think it's true that there, I don't know any test that's perfect, you know, and I think yeah. there can be some, um, some uh, tests that aren't perfect in terms of their sens sensitivity and specificity. I would say for the dotatate, you know, uh, somatostatin PET scans, those are the best out there. I mean, that's, that's the best that we have for imaging. Um, there are selected cases, for example, where you don't detect something because it doesn't express the receptors. So while most well-differentiated tumors will express somatostatin receptors, there are cases where they don't express them. And we do see those with some regularity. So that's why it's important, in my opinion, to also remember imaging with contrast. So um, that would be your typical MRI or CT scan with contrast. Remember a lot of the PET scans that are done don't use IV contrast for them. They're really just focused on the PET tracer uptake and taking that sort of general photograph to see where the PET tracer goes. And then when you do that kind of PET imaging, you are gonna miss your ability to really see um, and measure tumors, for example, in the liver um, well, as well as you can on the CT scan or the MRI with contrast. So if they can be done at the same time, that's ideal, but not a lot of institutions do that. So they're complementary, And most patients will have a good CT scan with contrast or a good MRI with contrast, as well as a somatostatin receptor PET image. And like I said, when they can be can be combined, that's great, but that's not often uh, widely available. But they're they're complementary in the information they provide. And for people who in whom there's a really um, high suspicion of a neuroendocrine tumor and the scans are negative, then um, that's a challenging problem. It's fortunately increasingly rare that we see that because our imaging has gotten better. 
But sometimes what we'll do is we'll repeat the imaging over time um, or um, uh, consider other strategies for identifying the primary site. Got it. Well, thank you for that. Now, we've got just about 10 minutes left, folks, and a lot of questions. So we're going to keep plugging right along. Dr. Bergson, thank you so much for, for everything. Uh, today, Tom, who I believe uh, earlier said that you are his specialist, uh, says, please describe what causes wide swings in carcinoid syndrome symptoms among those with well-differentiated tiny tumors. Um, I, I'm not sure I know the answer to that. Um, what we do know is that if the tumor arises in the small bowel or in the GI tract, um, the most likely situation in which we see carcinoid syndrome is when they're spread to the liver. Mm -hmm. And that's because the hormones that are made by these tumors are normally cleared by the liver, but the way the blood flow is in and out of the liver, the liver can't do that for tumors that are in the liver and directly dumping their hormones into the blood supply. So that's a kind of a first principle that at least for GI tumors, usually we don't see carcinoid syndrome unless it's in the liver. Um, but there are other sites of disease, for example, in the lungs where you can get carcinoid syndrome without having liver metastases. So that's sort of just the background for when we see carcinoid syndrome. And interestingly, we don't typically see carcinoid syndrome at all from tumors that arise in the rectum, which is, you know, it's interesting. And, and I think we don't really understand why that's the case, but that's been well documented. Why there are swings and why people have have flares, I think is less well understood. I think we know certain things can trigger carcinoid syndrome, whether it's certain foods or exercise or stress can trigger uh, carcinoid syndrome. But um, beyond that, I think it's somewhat mysterious. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, Tom. Hope you're having a great day. Uh, next question, Karen says, is it safe to take metoprolol, uh, which I believe is for high blood pressure or something, is that right? Um, yeah. why, why, is it safe to take met metoprolol while on lanreotide? Yeah, I mean, we have a lot of patients that are on metoprolol and other, metoprolol. other agents like that. I think, um, you know, the, it's a blood pressure agent. It also lowers the heart rate, though. And there, there can be lower heart rates in patients on somatostatin analogs, although in practice, it tends to not be a barrier for treating patients. I've had a few patients over the years with really low heart rates at baseline, and we've had cardiology evaluate them, and they'll, they'll often just make sure that it, it comes up accordingly when you exercise, and then we, if it does, we go ahead with lanreotide and octreotide. So I think it would be have to be assessed on a case-by-case -case basis, but um, in my experience, um, this hasn't been an issue, and I haven't found low heart rates to be a major problem on patients on somatostatin analogs. Uh, whether or not they're on a drug like metoprolol. Got it. Thanks, Karen. Allison says, my husband hasn't had, had a net removed from the small intestine. Uh, afterwards, we learned that he has carcinoid in, in lymph nodes. Why didn't, why wouldn't they take the, the lymph nodes as well? And then what would the normal follow-up be in this kind of situation? So this is a really good question. I, I don't know all the details here, but one situation to be aware of that is pretty common is a surgery that's required emergently. So, uh, you know, someone has a bowel obstruction, they have surgery in the middle of the night, and the surgeon going into the operation may not have any idea what the cause of the bowel obstruction is mm -hmm. and does the surgery that seems appropriate for that time and then a couple of weeks later, when the dust settles, you're aware of the pathology. Now you know there's a neuroendocrine tumor. And that does happen occasionally. I would say that when, when we are anticipating a neuroendocrine tumor, ideally, and then I'm, I'm, I'm gonna tell you what my surgical colleagues do at my institution, ideally they will feel the whole bowel because we know that these tumors can be multifocal in about 30% of the cases, meaning there can be a couple of them, not just one. So they will feel the bowel to see if there are other tumors mm -hmm. and then they'll remove the draining lymph nodes um, and, any, and any swollen or enlarged lymph nodes that are uh, uh, identifiable during surgery. But that, that is um, sometimes I think just not on the radar when it's happening in an, especially in an emergent setting, when somebody's having a bowel obstruction, the surgeon's just going in to relieve that acute problem. 
And the, the, the follow-up, I should say afterwards, it really depends. If it looks like there's obvious nodal disease that's left, like let's say on a DOTA scan, then it could be ultimately that a surgeon goes back in and completes the operation and takes out the nodes. Right. Um, certainly at a very, at a bare minimum, um, this person, you know, your husband would need to have follow-up over time with scans. Um, but I would say if there is residual disease, it would be worth revisiting the idea of resection, uh, potentially seeing a specialist um, to see if that's an, a possibility at that point. Got it. Thanks, Allison, and good luck to you and your husband. We appreciate you being here and, tr and trying to learn as much as you can. That's what we're here for. Next question. We've got a few more minutes. Uh, Karen says, and a lot of people share this question, what can we do to decrease our serotonin levels? In, uh, so I would say I'm going to specifically focus on a carcinoid syndrome patient with serotonin uh, that's high. Um, in, you know, there may be certain foods that trigger um, carcinoid syndrome symptoms. And I would encourage anybody with carcinoid syndrome to meet with a nutritionist to kind of go over what's, what's a good diet to be on uh, specifically related to patients with carcinoid syndrome. Um, the mainstay of therapy for sure is going to be a somatostatin analog. So octreotide or lamreotide. Um, there is a drug called telotrostat, also known as Zermelo. That's FDA approved that actually inhibits the, the production of serotonin and has been shown to reduce diarrhea in patients who have refractory carcinoid syndrome. So that's another option to consider and talk to your healthcare provider about. And then there are strategies to do what we call debulking. So remember a lot of our agents that we treat patients with stabilize tumors. They don't necessarily do a great job of shrinking tumors, but people who have carcinoid syndrome and high serotonin levels often benefit from that sort of shrinking and getting the tumor amount down. And that we can sometimes do by liver embolization. So that's a good strategy to think about or surgical debulking um, would be, I would say the two mainstays that we consider and surgery is not for everyone. You really need to take some multidisciplinary team to make those decisions, but um, that is often an approach can, that can be really helpful for people with high serotonin levels. Sure. All right. Thank you for your answer, Dr. Bergsland. Thank you for your question, Karen. Uh, I think we've got time for just uh, one or two more. Um, Allison says, is there any connection between net and small intestines and AFib? I do not know of any relationship between the two. Got it. Uh, can you help explain the infusion to help strengthen our bones? Okay. Yeah. So there are a couple of infusions out there for people who have bone metastases mm -hmm. and uh, those are called bone health agents. Uh, one is called denosumab, also known as Exgeva. And the other one is um, zolindronic acid, acid, also known as Zomata. And um, those are agents that help to strengthen the bones. Um, and uh, they're also similar agents are used in osteoporosis. So the idea is to try to make the bones a little bit harder and less likely to have problems related to the tumors such as fractures or pain. And we don't have good data in neuroendocrine tumors specifically, but extrapolating from other tumor types, these agents reduce the risk of complications from bone metastases. Mm -hmm. And so they're used on a case-by-case -case basis in patients with neuroendocrine tumors involving the bone. Got it. Dr. Bergson, when we first started, I asked you, you know, about some of the leaps forward that we've experienced that have helped you do your job better. And you had mentioned that um, there is, is still uh, opportunity for growth in certain areas. Is there an area that would you really hope that we unlock? If you had a magic wand and you could say like, oh, I, we need improvement in this aspect, it would really, you know, take us to another level. Um, what, what would that be? What are the struggles that you still face with this, this disease, knowing that it's completely unique to each case? And that's, that's a, I know that's a big, broad question, but is there something specific yeah. that you're like, if we could unlock this, that would help so much? Yeah. I mean, I really, I do think, I want to preface this by saying that for anybody with this disease, their disease matters. And I, I really think that's true. And whether you're living it for a, with it for a long time 
or you have a more aggressive disease, it's, it's very impactful on, on your lives. And I, I definitely, definitely understand that in different ways, by the way, like, and I think we're just beginning to understand the ways this affects patients, both long-term and short-term, For sure. but I would say in terms of immediate unmet needs, I think poorly differentiated neuroendocrine carcinomas just really have not benefited the way many of our other disease areas have in terms of new strategies. And for me, that's one area that I, I'm really hoping that we can make a dent in over the next couple of years because they tend to be either resistant to chemotherapy upfront or rapidly resistant to chemotherapy after initial benefit. Mm-hmm. And so I, I feel like there is there's some way we can tackle this over the next few years with the people that are working on this. And I, I'm really hoping we can make an advance in that area. I hope so too. Um, well, that is our show for today. Dr. Bergson, thank you so much for joining us. It was a pleasure to have you. You were amazing as I knew you would be. Thank you so much for having me. It's really been, been fun. Absolutely. And thank you all at home for joining us. And as always, we hope this program helped answer some of your questions. And a reminder, if you have follow-up questions or if we didn't get to your question, please reach out to the Carcinoid Cancer Foundation, either here on their Facebook page, you can send them a private message or at their website, www.carcinoid.org. Thanks again, as always, to our presenting sponsor, Tercera Therapeutics. We really couldn't do this program without them. And finally, my name is Rain Bennett. I have been your host. Thank you for watching. Please join us next time on Luncheon with the Experts. Stay healthy, stay safe, everybody. Bye-bye.